All right. It's a bag of wisdom. I'm Ryan, and this is my bag of wisdom. <laughs> All right, good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> I'll be here for the next uh, three weeks. That's it. Uh, yeah. So I'm Ryan D. Krauss. Yeah, where's the bag? It's metaphorical bag. Where's the bag? It's there. It's my backpack <laughs> of a bag. I'm D. Kraus. I'm 22. Been here a while. At least 22 years. That's it. I own at least two video games. I won't tell you how many, but there's at least two. I mean, you're not wrong. Yeah. So isn't that kind of giving a hint as to how many? It's not zero and it's not one. Yeah. So, that, that narrows it down a bit. That eliminates the, the Yeah, numbers. that's fair. My favorite video game is Super Mario World 2, Yours Island. It's the best game. You should play it. You should play it. And uh, I can finally say this again, starting you know last week, that I've beaten every Legend of Zelda game that we speak of. So, which ones don't does that include of? Link's Adventure? Zelda 2? Yes. Because wasn't the... Never mind then. Right. Zelda, <laughs> Zelda 2. Zelda 2. Well, that you had to beat. Don't you beat the original. We not speak of. Yeah. With the walkthrough? Yeah. Getting <laughs> <laughs> good luck, dude. Was yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, more about me. I started programming all the way back in 2009. That was a while ago. I took one Python course, and then I was like, awesome. And then I didn't really want to do it for a while because I was like, man, programming is fun, but I want to build roller coasters. And then I learned, took a game maker class in my high school, which I think was 2011. Wait. I don't know. Paperville offered that? Yeah. There's a game maker class? Yeah, there was a game like, maker class. Using game software? maker? Using game maker. What? I learned game maker in high school, and I had made games. And that was my first experience with it. Yeah. And then I took the second programming course, you know, the semester before I graduated, because I was like, you know what, I've decided now that I will be a software engineer. I should probably get some more experience with this. So that was nice. Uh, I've been with the club since the beginning of my time here, all four years. Uh, secretary, starting December to May 2016, so a year and a half. Uh, and then vice president I've been doing the last year. That's been fun. Who was VP last year? Seth. Seth was. Wait, has Seth ever been here? It was weird. Yeah. I just remembered you being at the meetings. Right That's because I was secretary. I heard you were secretary. Yeah. I've been I've been on the exec team for two and a half years, yeah. Uh, and then just some classes that I made games in. Two twenty nine, now known as three twenty seven. Uh, if you take with Jeremy Schaefer, you make a roguelike dungeon game. Three oh nine, you get to pick your own project. So we made, not Minecraft. Um, you made that. <laughs> with four thirty seven, that's the actual game dev semester long course. So you know I made Reversi. Uh, asteroids and then other kind of group project thing. Um, 402 is the year long game dev course. Um, we're working on that Crown Warriors card game that I've talked to some of you about. And then 491 is senior design. We also decided to make a game for that because we're like, hey, games are fun. So that's my history of that. Um, kind of now looking back and everything, reflecting with everything, just some, just some words of wisdom and from my bag metaphorical bag for all you youngins out here. Um, you'll never do everything you want to do. With that I mean you'll always look back and be like, man, I should have done more. Should have made more games. Should have flushed this out more. No matter what you do, you're always going to think that. So just don't be afraid of that. Just be aware it's going to happen. Uh, making video games takes time and effort. Um, I had to practice to get to where I am now. I didn't know, I, I don't know everything. I still don't know everything. You actually have to kind of build it up over time just by practicing, by making games. And you can't just be like, man, I'm gonna sit down and make, I don't know, like an MMO. No, you gotta actually like work on that. You gotta build up to it. And so that's where the time and effort kind of comes in. Uh, you have to be willing to learn to make a game. Like I said, I didn't know everything and I still don't know everything. I'm still learning along the way. So you actually have to be willing to actually figure out issues yourself and actually have to kind of go looking for those answers, either you know online, asking other people in the club, et cetera. Um, you can't just be like, man, well, I don't know it. I guess I'm just going to trash the game now. You actually got to keep working towards that goal that you've set for yourself by actually 
going out and finding the answers, either by trial and error, um, find someone who's already know the answer, etc. And then finally, of course, you have to be willing to make a game. That means you actually have to sit down, find time to actually program it, do your art thing, make music, whatever you want to do. You actually do have to put in the time and effort to make that game because, you know, if you're just doing it because you want to, I don't know, make a good impression with your friends in the game development club and you're not doing it just to make a game, then you're not going to get very far. So... You want to make games, make games. Yeah, bag of wisdom. And these are the five tips that I've kind of built up over the years, and it's kind of been modified a little bit, but these are where my big philosophies come for making games. So number one, like your idea. If you don't like your idea, you're going to hate making it. Like, simple as that. Um, that being said, your idea is going to change as you're doing it or as you're kind of planning it, so don't be married to your idea. But be aware that um, don't let it don't let your idea stray too far from its intended path, which leads into my next point: don't make it harder than it needs to be. This is where we talk about you know scope creep and all that stuff. Um, if you want to say you know what, I'm going to make this really cool game, and then just for the hell of it, we'll make it you know procedurally generated so everyone has levels to play. I mean, you don't need to do that if this is like your first or second game. You can do it later, but for now, just Stick with what you know, build up slowly, and don't overwhelm yourself. Because once you start to overwhelm yourself, you give up on the game, and the game just never gets done. Number three, have a schedule and stick to it. Um, I've talked with you a couple of this, a couple of this as well. Um, when it comes to making games, you can't just make a game, you know, once every month, or like program something once every month or whatever. You kind of always got to be sticking with it because if you stay away from your game too much. You kind of forget what you were doing the last time. You kind of forget what your goals were. Uh, but if you have a schedule that you kind of stick to, you know, once every week, twice every week, three times every week, whatever you want to do, um, it kind of just becomes a habit that you're making this game your own and you kind of stick with it along the way. Four is tell others about your game because, one, if you have people expecting things, it kind of is a bit more motivating to actually work on your game because if people are asking, man, how's that game that you're working on coming? How's that going so far for you? Well, if, you're, if your answer is always, yeah, well, I haven't really worked on it as much, and then they keep asking, you know, how's it going? How's it going? You're like, well, I'm just not working on it. Well, that should be a wake-up call that, oh, people actually want to see this game completed, so you should actually work on that game yourself so other people can actually see it, play it, love it, etc. And finally, the most important one is don't be afraid to fail. With making games, like I said, you're not going to know everything. And some things you're just going to want to try just to see what you can do when it comes in terms of scope. And you say, okay, I want to make this game. It's got you know, 10 levels. It's got 15 enemies, whatever. Um, you'll try to do it, and you'll be like, man, this, I just can't do this. Don't treat that as a failure, though. Don't treat that as a learning experience. But even though you didn't achieve your goal, it's still okay because you got something out of that experience. Deep, I know. So, uh, I've got some handouts for all you all to kind of fill out and just kind of remember me in some form, some form, and also kind of remember why you're making games. So, I've got my handouts here, and basically, there's just some fill in the blank stuff. So the first one is, I make games to blank, so what's the point of you making games? This is kind of what your motivation is just for making games in general, and if you always remember that, then hopefully you'll always keep tying yourself back to that feeling whenever you get discouraged when making a game. Um, next, you know, my favorite game to memory is blank. Always just, you know, usually it's a happy memory, I hope, or at least something that uh, made you feel better about game development, but it's your choice. My it's your choice. Game is I failed. <laughs> yeah, and then one other, one other fun one, I guess, is if you had limited time, money, and resources, you would make this game. Just, just so you have a dream, something you're shooting for. And then, to remember where you've been, my first game I made was blank, and your definition of first game can be really whatever you want, because my first game was just the first game that I learned from a tutorial. And then the first game I made that I was proud of was, well, this is actually the point you realize, you know, I can do this, 
this is where I'm meant to be. And then also on the bottom left, I put those five tips there so you always have those handy. And then on the bottom right, I have a blank section for games completed tally. Um, so every time you finish a game or complete a game, and again, your definition of completed might be different than mine, uh, but every time you complete a game, just put a tally mark there so you can always see how you're growing over time. So I'm gonna hand these out to the four people here. And you're welcome to fill these out, frame them, put them on your door, dresser, whatever. This, uh, fill them out whenever. I've got pens. I don't have pens. I don't have pens. I've got two pens. Uh, I've got two pens. Got a pencil. Yeah. I've actually got a lot more than two pens. And so, again, with this, it's just meant to be motivating you whenever you get discouraged within game development. Because with game development, like I said, you're always going to run into those blocks. You're always going to be discouraged about not being able to finish your game. But if you have this, this thing that I made in half an hour, I think can be the key to kind of getting you back on track. So while you're all filling it out, this is my answers in a, in a rare moment of openness. Uh, this is Ryan's game development motivation. So I make games to make people feel. By that I mean with video games there is a message usually that you're trying to convey similar to books and movies. Uh, games are just another medium to get that message across. Um, so if I can you know, help people understand that message easier through games, um, get my message across, and that's really what I'm trying to do here. Uh, my favorite game, Dev Memories, of course, finishing my first game, um, because that was the actual time where I realized, okay, this is actually, I enjoy doing this, I'm very proud of this, let's keep going. Um, if I had limited time, money, and resources, I'd make this game. I just had the best racing game ever, because I really love racing games. I didn't have much more details than that, though. Um, my first game I made was, this was in the high school game dev course. We had a book called The Game Maker's Apprentice. You might have heard of it. Um, the first chapter was you make a game called Evil Clutches, and you're basically just a monster on the left side of the screen going up and down, and there's a monster on the right side of the screen going up and down, and the monster on the right is shooting fireballs at you, but it's also giving you, like, dragon babies, and you're supposed to dodge the fireballs and hurt the other monster on the right side of the screen, but you're still supposed to collect the dragon babies. So it was this fun little game. Um, it took maybe like a day or two to kind of implement, but it was my first game. Um, the first game I made that I was proud of, and some of you have seen this, this is my White Elephant Tower Defense game. Um, this was for the 48-hour game jam. I don't think I slept more than six hours an entire weekend, but at the same time, when it came out, it was my first time that I had done actual programming within Game Maker instead of the drag and drop. I had done so many more features than I wanted to. Um, and it was, it was really good just to see people play it, and it's actually up on the internet now if people do want to get it, but um, that's that. And then the games completed, I only have five games completed by my definition. Um, and since people were maybe wondering, um, this is the way the evil clutches looked. By the way, I stole this image off Google Images. So this actually isn't my game, but it's the same kind of feeling. There's different monsters. You fight them by shooting fireballs. They shoot fireballs at you. There's a score you can lose. By definition, it's a game. Um, and this is the first game I was proud of. This is the White Elephant game. Um, all made in Game Maker. Um, there were four different towers you could place, and the towers you know, did different things. One did splash damage, one did slow, one actually reversed the elephants back for a while. Um, and then within those towers, there actually were different upgrades as well. So like we have cool little icons next to each tower. Um, denoting their rank. Um, there's different strengths of elephants. Every elephant had its own health bar. Um, they all followed, you know, the path is set. You couldn't place towers, you know, on the path. You could see the range of the towers as you're placing them. So a lot of cool different features that, you know, just were fun to implement. Um, one thing that I was trying to put at the end was a speed up button, because every tower defense needs that. But the way I coded it with using the room speed of Game Maker, I was like, yeah, this is too hard. So I didn't get to do that, but that was that. Um, so that's me, and that's uh, my motivation for making games. I don't really have anything else other than that, I don't think. So I will leave the room open to questions now if there's anything else that you wanted to know.
that maybe I know. Yes, Jacob. If you had one thing you could go back and tell mm -hmm. young Ryan, yeah, with the big old eyes, yeah, looking at the video games, yep, and like that, yep. Could, if you had exactly one thing to tell him, what would you say? Can it be a run-on sentence? Okay, well, you said one thing, so I was sure if that was like... One idea. Okay. I would probably say start smaller with the games and then actually finish the games that you start. Because there are a lot of games that are on my hard drive today that just haven't been touched in years that are just dead. And they're probably never going to get finished. They're probably never going to be revived. I'm going to look at them in a couple years and be like, oh, yeah, I remember when I tried to do that, and then I'll repeat that every couple years. Oh, yeah, that still hasn't happened. So, Remember that was an idea that was cool. yeah, basically, start small, finish games. Um, what was the first game you made here at Iowa State? Pfft, probably the tower defense one, because that was the first game jam, September 2013. Um, that would have been the first game. That's right, you weren't here my first game jam. Yeah. The luck one. Yep, I did not do luck game jam. I can't remember the name of mine, so I can't put it down on my list. <laughs> yeah. I had a question. Oh, my first name was Tic Tac Toe. Well, figure it out. <laughs> Make up a question. My favorite color is blue. What question should we be asking you? The good ones. <laughs> or the okay ones. Or the bad ones. I'm really not picky. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, the hardest thing I ever had to implement in a game was the first time I ever had to do um, multiplayer networking for my game. This was with uh, Not Minecraft. Um, so basically, because it's multiplayer, you yeah, you, you need one, you need two machines, basically, to actually test. Um, or you can build it and open up two windows, but either way, then you don't have like your output and such. So there's a lot of guess and check there. And just, yeah, just the way um, network works with Unity, like there's a lot of things like hidden behind the scenes that you don't need to know about, but like if you don't understand like the core concept, like you don't know how they work, how to hook them up to your stuff. Um, so that was a lot of trial and error. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's some good tutorials out there, but like we were doing a lot more than the tutorials were probably ever intending us to do so but I figured it out eventually so it's a hard hard fought battle Jacob um, are you, is this going to be your career as a game developer so I'm going to work at a software engineering company as a software engineer it's not a game developer but I'm still hoping to continue this on the side you know in my free time um, call it a hobby if you will, but eventually I'd like to make it my full-time job, as is. Um, I like making games, I like seeing people play games, and if I see them playing my games, so when that's go? my, that's my, I make games to blink thing, is to see people feel things from my games. So what what do you what's your perfect game for to make people feel? Um, Is it similar to The Last of Us? Yeah, let me let me ask a question. That'll, so that'll last that. Last of Us is a good game in the sense that it's more. So I'm gonna take another tangent before I answer that question. So there's always been an issue when it comes to turning movies into video games, and the reason why that is is because they're different mediums. And there's different ways to kind of show story. For example, with a movie, everything needs to be shown to the person watching the video. It's a very guided path um, through dialogue, through different shots of the video. You can see kind of the whole story. With games, there's a lot more exploration and um, side things that you might not actually get through your first playthrough. Um, you kind of have to play it again or explore new areas. So with video games, there's a lot more, um, I guess, personalized story within it. The stories that you create, for example, Jake and I were talking earlier about, you know, finding monsters in Breath of the Wild um, and whatnot, like just 
getting that moment to happen. It's not scripted in any way. It's just we stumbled upon it, and then this event started to happen because we were in the area. Um, it didn't have to happen. We could have gone around it. We could have just never known about it if we just walked around it. But the, the fact that we went there and this started happening, that's kind of our own story. It's like, okay, well, now I feel like this is you know a very wilderness area because these monsters keep popping up out of nowhere and they're attacking me now. So with that, um, it's a lot easier to make the story feel more personal, I guess. And by doing that, more people are able to understand the story themselves because they can relate to it. To that somewhat answer your question because I feel like I tied it back at the end, just at the end. Okay. So you don't want to make things made by copy though. That's what I'm getting. I don't want to play... Wait, what? You don't want to make things similar to what Naughty Dog makes. What do you mean? Well, Uncharted 4 is basically just a movie. Okay, well, we don't talk about Uncharted 4. The other three were pretty good, I've heard. I, I actually haven't played them. I've so. never played them, so. Yeah. 4 got good reviews, I thought. Yeah, four it, it people, like four people were saying it was just a cutscene with a walking sim in between each cutscene. Well, they literally had a feature where you could just auto in your gun. Like, you just auto targeted everything yeah. you just shot at. It's like, that's not a game. Yeah. It's literally not a game. I also. I also don't like shooters, for the record. Oh. There's that. I almost, I was um, like, the ground what and was then, your first M-rated game. Yeah, and then <laughs> with um, you know, with games, like there needs, there's also that sense of accomplishment as well. For example, like you know, games try to do the easy, medium, and hard modes and whatnot. And I say try because sometimes it doesn't always work as intended, of course. Um, and so with that, like, there is again that own personal sense of accomplishment by you know defeating an enemy, defeating a hard boss, finishing the game even. Um, if you're just kind of, if it just holds your hand the entire way, so that's, that's just a movie then. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a basic interactive movie where it's like, press A to continue, which is not a game in my eyes. So Ryan, what, uh, what was your first M-rated game? My first M-rated game was The Last of Us. Uh, last a year and a half ago. Really? Yeah. What? My first T-rated game was Guitar Hero when I was 12. You weren't even a teen. I was not. I had a talk. My parents had to get in it, and they were skeptical because of the lyrics. That's why I was rated T, of course. Uh, they didn't want me playing the lyrics around my little sister, who was, she would have been eight at the time. Seven or eight. My first M mm -hmm. game was also Halo 3. <laughs> yeah. well, mine, mine was the original Halo. I used Halo. to go to her friend's house oh. and play it, because I couldn't play it. Well, in the Halo stage, then. My first team so we're still connected, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and in fact, that was the reason my mom didn't want me to get an Xbox 360 was because she knew more of the games on Xbox 360 were rated M <laughs> than on the GameCube. <laughs> yeah. And so she knew that I would start asking to buy a rated M game. Yeah. My household grew up with uh, Nintendo consoles mostly. Um, the only Sony console we had was the PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. And by that time, you know, I was only, you know, up to 12, 13. So, like, we weren't even looking at the M rated games yet. Um, didn't get a PS3, um, and then by that time we were selling the Wii, um, DS games, you know. I don't think there are that many M-rated DS games or Wii games that people intended to Is get. Is there an M-rated DS game? Uh, probably. Yeah. probably. I'm sure there are, but like... Have they recorded no, something Call of Duty? Oh, they, yeah, they did. They had Call of Duty on the Wii, but uh, like no like one the did that. On the DS there was, <laughs> yeah, but they got downgraded to teens. Yeah. yeah. I remember that. Anyway, besides the point, I I besides the point, uh, any other questions from my bag of wisdom? <clears throat> so, I want you to reiterate, if you had unlimited time, money, yeah. and resources, yeah. what game would you make? I said the best racing game ever. <laughs> the best racing game ever. Like Ryan, the best racing game yes. ever. Yes. The best racing game ever. <laughs> Cause there's so there's a lot of different like you know subgenres of racing games. For example, there's like I'm, I'm gonna tell you now. <laughs> there's like the uh, let's just say party racing game where there's items and you're trying to use the items to come in first. There's the 
strict racing games, I guess I'll call them, where it's literally just racing. It's like real life racing, which I don't like those as much because. Yeah, like NASCAR, Gran Turismo. Gran Turismo, like recently. Gran Turismo 1 and 2, I fucking love those. Forza's a racing game. Forza. Forza's also one, yeah. The hyper-realistic ones you're not so big on? I'm not so big on those, no. It's just too much for me. And then there's kind of the in-between one where this one I'll refer to as the oh, yeah. the tricky genre, subgenre. And by that I mean uh, there is... A series that I love called Trackmania, where <laughs> you basically make these just insane courses where there's a bunch of jumps and loop de loops and crazy stunts happening, and you're still racing for first place. You're still there's no items, but at the same time, like the courses themselves are fun because it's online service. People make them themselves, and there's just always online service rounding going on. But what? Hold up. What? Hold up. What? What? No, 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 like, like you hold up on the track. They make those where you just hold one button and it goes through. Oh, yeah. Okay, them. I don't like those as much. I don't like those as much. But, like, but if you can actually, like, there's some, there's a lot of fun that goes into just making those crazy courses because you do have to, you know, work on your steering. You have to brake, which is a racing game. Usually doesn't happen as much, but. Have you ever seen the game? Uh, I think it was, like, a Steam, I don't know, it was Steam Greenland, but it's basically... Someone's driving, one person's putting them. Yes. Like yeah, there were, yeah, that game where you're basically driving a car as recklessly. Like, is this a co-op or versus? No, I, I can't I remember. It's a co-op, but like, yeah, I think it's a co-op, but. If you stop moving, you blow up. Yeah. And you have to keep putting pieces and you kind of don't know yep. what you're going to get. So, yeah, player one drives, player two makes the road as you're driving it. But, like, there's just, it's so quickly, like, I haven't seen it done well. that well. <laughs> it's, a, it's, I think it's online. It's an online game. Um, I don't know the name of it, but that's the gist of it. That one looked. That one looked fun. I think it could be better. Obviously, fleshed out more. Yeah. 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 Online or couch co-op? Uh, online or couch co-op probably has to be couch co-op. Um, I would say um, one. It's you know. A lot cheaper because you don't need two consoles for starters. Um, two, it's a lot more, I guess, personal or whatever to actually be sitting next to the person you're playing against or with um, than across, you know, the airwaves or whatever. Because um, one, you could we punch them. Right? You could punch them if they <laughs> they don't like you. Um, if you don't have friends, well, it just means- get friends. One in hundred friends are us. Friends are something. But yeah, co-op co-op is the way to go. Obviously, not a lot of people are doing it anymore, just because it's just not a thing anymore. Um, PC games are still doing it because those are PC games, but uh, the consoles aren't doing it as much as they were before. Now, because they're one, they're trying to push their online services, and two, like people just don't go to other people's houses to play video games anymore. It's a sad time. Yep. Um, yeah. I really like the. There are a few Wii, Wii games where there where it's like couch co op and online. Yeah. Like, um, I know Mario Kart Wii, you could have two people. Mm-hmm. Like, you have a friend come over, and then you can both go online from your console. Yep. That's really awesome. That was really yeah. Awesome. Mario Kart Wii was a really good example, and the other Mario Karts as well. Um, they did the whole local play, they also did um, the online play. And so, what you do, especially with Mario Kart Wii, you could. You could have two people go online. You could have one person on their account, and you could have a second player as a guest, which doesn't really matter in the long run, because I would always be player one, my little sister would be player two. Well, it turns out, if you intentionally have player two drive backwards, sabotage other players, you both get kicked. Fun fact. <laughs> um, so we never did that again. But uh, yeah, at the same time, it's local within the two of you, but at the same time, there still is that online competitive of online play. For example, like if it's if it's just you two just local co op, like, you know, it's just you two finding out, but with AI that usually are not up to snuff. Um, but when you go online, like that's actually real people, real thoughts within your internal, you know, battle, whatever you want to call it, there still is that outside factor you really do have to watch out for. By the way, yeah. there are a total of ten M rated games for the Nintendo DS. 
10 M rated games for the Nintendo DS. Fantastic. Yeah, we need to go find all of them and play them. <laughs> I actually really want to play them. Yeah. Seems like it's a really good game. Any other questions? Um, how, what are your tips in making sure you keep your scope in check? So that, <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty important question. Um, so to keep your scope in check, th the bad answer is you just have to figure it out. The good answer is you need to start smaller than you would expect not bigger than you want to. So for example, um, you know, with game jams, you're pretty limited what you can do with 48 hours, but if you had to say game, make a game and say a month or something, or you know, three months, six months, a year, whatever. Actually, I would say don't do a year. If you're making a game that you're planning on working on more than three months for, and this is your first game or first kind of real game, I wouldn't do that. Start smaller, even, that, even, even smaller than that. Um, when it comes to actually figuring out, you know, what you can do and what you can't do, you do have to actually, you know, sit down and do it. Um, and but while you're doing, it, you kind of keep track of, you know, what I thought, you know, just getting the player to move, that was only going to take like a week of work. But you know, we're a month in. Well, crap, that's our entire game now. Um, so it's just kind of you learn your own um, capabilities as you keep making games. And then as you get more and more people on your team, as you kind of work on games more with people, like you kind of learn their uh, capabilities as well. And then you just kind of build it up over time to see, okay, this is a good goal for us. We can do this. Um, yeah, unfortunately I can't just be like, you, oh yeah, you look like you can make a game and you know, maybe, you know, yeah, two months, yeah. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, what kind of game? Like, is it gonna be, Five Nights at Freddy, that was the first game I thought of for some reason, or Yoshi's Island, you know. Um, obviously, you, or in fact any of us, could make Yoshi's Island in two months. Um, so, when you're coming up with your game idea, for starters, you should be writing down your idea, and you should be writing down exactly, more or less, kind of what you want to go into that game, because that way, if in your original plan, you don't have a feature, but then you're coming, you know, as you're kind of working more and more on it, you're like, oh, you know what, we should add this feature. Well, that's how scope creep happens for starters. And if you write it down at the start, then you just kind of stick to that plan and say, okay, you know what, this wasn't in my intended idea, we don't need to actually do it. There are the exceptions, of course, for example, like, you just didn't think of something at the start where you do need to add it. But at the same time, you shouldn't be adding, you know, oh man, we should just put teleporters on a game because teleporters are cool. Um, if your reasoning for putting something in a game is because it's cool, that should be a big sign, don't do it. <laughs> um, you need to have a reason for it. Um, so that's also something. But as far as terms of figuring out what you can do and can do, it does just take practice. It does take some learning. So, you know, with game jams, we give you 48 hours. 48 hours isn't really a good span of time to figure out what you can and can't do just because those 48 hours are not Normal. normal for what you would be doing developing yeah like you're not going to be doing those kind of hours making a game um, if, you are, if you are you're going to die I'm going to tell you that right now um, you know just try one thing that I one thing that I like to do um, either when I'm making learning like a new engine or new learning a new language etc um, I remake a game that already exists so for example I've remade Pong because it's easy I've made um, Breakout, which is Pong, but with bricks instead. Um, I've done Space Invaders, which isn't really like Pong, but whatever. Um, and then I think I've done... Oh, I've done the fourth one, but I can't remember what it was, so it's not important. I've only done three. Um, but by learning, by just doing those games and doing those tutorials, even if it's guided, you can still understand, you know, oh, this is how long it took me to make this full game. Um, and as you can say, you know, Pong, Breakout... Space Invaders, you know, they all all have their different levels of difficulty and content that goes into them. Um, but just with that kind of small milestone, you can kind of see, okay, well, this took me a, a week to make. Well, 
maybe if I added some more stuff, this would take me another week. And then you just kind of keep building up from what your expectations are. And then final thing I'm gonna end on with this question is, no matter what you think you're gonna do, you're gonna run out of time. Um, no matter what you do, no matter how long you think it's gonna take, it's gonna take more time than you think. Even if it's something that you've done 10 times before, you know, if you're making, I mean, you're not gonna make the same game 10 times in a row, but even if it's like, if you, <laughs> what do you point? Anyway, if you're, if you're just doing like walking or jumping, basic platformer stuff, you know, 10 times, um, it's always gonna be different because it always has to fit the game that you're making. And so that always takes time to kind of modify. You'll have to change things as you're making more of the game. So just because you've done something before, it doesn't mean that word for word, it's always gonna take the same amount of time. So account for that extra time, and that time is what we call crunch period, unfortunately, because that's the time we realize, oh man, I've got all this things I still need to do, and I thought I planned for this, but I didn't, so now it's all gonna get done next weekend, and then you die, and then you cry a lot, but it's fun because then you're ready for the next game. So, are you looking up Hofstetter's Law? <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at, uh, time, at uh, time management. Yeah, there was an XKCD, which uh, had the time management. Yeah, something like that. Um, so basically, there's also Hofstetter's Law, which is in programming. Um, basically, um, I think it is... Okay, I don't remember the exact definition of it. But there's another saying that's kind of related to Hofstetter's Law, where it's 90% of development... Or shit. Fuck, I don't know. 10% of development... Okay, 90% of development takes up 90% of the time, and the remaining 10% takes up 90% of the time as well. That's not word for word the quote. I kind of butchered a lot, but basically it's saying, you know, um, and with that, it's actually, you know, more of the finishing part of your game. Finishing your game is the hardest part. Um, with Hofstetter's Law, like, you know, even if you account for something, um, projects take, so the first, I think the first point of Hofstetter's Law is projects take more time than you expect them to. They'll take more time than the time you allocate for it. Point two for Hofstetter's Law is games will take more, or projects will take more time to complete than you expected, even when you take into account Hofstetter's Law. <laughs> <laughs> so no matter what you plan for, you're not gonna finish on time. Um, but as you kind of learn more and more about yourself, you'll kind of figure out, oh, this is where this big time chunk happened. Maybe I won't do that, spend that much time focusing on that chunk when it's maybe not even integral to the game. Um, you just kind of build up over time. I don't know. It's a lot of just guess and check, unfortunately. I just remembered there was a XKCD comic. I was like, I need to figure out how much time I need uh, to do this project. Yeah. Like, okay, uh, <laughs> take how much time you think you'll do it. Yep. Uh, you'll think you'll do it in, mm -hmm. then double it. Yep. Then double it again. Double it again. Then double it again. Yep. Uh, then add 52. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 36. Yep. Then uh, multiply it by four. Oh my god, you just spent 30 seconds trying yeah. to figure out how much time you'll do. You'll never get the product done. Yep. Panic. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. There's a reason why deadlines are usually missed when it comes to projects. Did a, did a XKC, whatever it is, yep. did a race comic, comic about uh, databasing yep. with the uh, <laughs> school. Yep. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. Ah, I'm so bad at estimating how long projects will take. Don't panic, there's a simple trick for that. Take your most realistic estimate, then double it. Okay, but now double it again, add five minutes. Double it a third time, okay. <laughs> 30 seconds have gone by and you've done nothing but double imaginary numbers. You're making no product <laughs> progress and will never finish. Ah, yep. panic. Uh. Yep, that's that. They had a great database one where the, the parents named their kid semicolon drop table students. Mm -hmm. Semicolon. Yep. So when they entered that into the school system, it dropped the entire student table and lost <laughs> all grades and all information. Yep. They were just like, what the fuck? Why'd you name your kid X that? XKCD is a... Like, this is my favorite webcomic. You just didn't protect By far. <laughs> Was that your comment you had to make with your hand, or do you have another question? No. Uh, did you ever forget it? Uh, oh. Something about rollerball. I was like, yeah, I bet, I bet I can do rollerball in like three months by now. Pretty sure I can do that. I would hope so. Jacob, you could definitely do rollerball. You could do it in three hours. It wouldn't take me longer <laughs> than three months, so therefore I've allocated enough That's time. Fair. That's fair. That's fair. 
That is fair. You would do it within those three months. It would. I yeah. hope. I, I hope I, you I, can. I mean, that's that's the summer. That's like me saying it's yeah. my goal this summer. I'll to probably to rig have roll a ball before I die. <laughs> Maybe someday. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe someday. All right. Any other questions before we wrap this up? Any tips for learning things like C sharp or a language? Um. One thing that actually really helped was learning Java alongside C Sharp, because they're pretty much the same. Um, I've actually, everything I know about C Sharp is self-taught. I've never been taught C Sharp by anyone. Same here. Um, but at the same time, you know, it has those parallels to Java, so I kind of know the basics of it. Um, as for learning a new language, like I said, you know, there's tutorials out there. Make a sample project like Pong or something, something simple that you know you can do. In fact, even before I knew games and whatnot, my first go-to program was just a guessing game where it would literally generate a random number between 1 and 100, and then you would just keep guessing to see if you got to that number. Because it taught you actually a lot of things. It taught you how to do randomness. It taught you to do a while loop. It taught you if-else statements. And uh, taught you input as well. So that was the basics of my language learning. And that I, was use, I would always use that every language I learned. I still do to this day. Yeah. Do you still use pointers? But so these pointers, yes, because you have to. What are you talking about? Like, What's your question? question everything, everything, is, everything, everything is pointers. Everything yeah. is a pointer in C sharp and Java, except for primitives. Fun fact: I got that question wrong in the Google interview. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was a trick question the way he asked. I was like, he was like, "How would you pass something in by?" Um, or not by reference, or whatever the opposite of that is. And I was like... By value? Yeah, by value. I was like, uh, I, I don't know. Because <laughs> everything is a pointer. The primitives aren't. Shame on them. Whatever. Oh, that's how he got you? Was he just saying, if you, would you do this with anything? Not whatever. Move it on. Something else? Mm. Cool. Anything else? Cool. Dumb. Well then... I'll leave you all with peace out, y'all. And then for the last time, go forth, make games, and be awesome. By the way, peace out. That's my Twitter. It's my portfolio. Check them out. They're pretty basic. Because I'm a basic bitch. You like Ryan. <laughs> uh, cool. See y'all. See y'all later.